in an age of small hybrid mirrorless cameras. With up to seven and a half stops of in-body image stabilization, why would anyone want to know how to use a tripod? Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And right, a lot has changed, especially over the last 100, 150 years. And yet there remain certain constants when it comes to tripods, no less true today than they were at the turn of the 19th century. One, stability is king. Two, smoothness is king too. Three, these two facts mean there are still instances where tripods are essential. And four, if you're willing to incur the cost, weight, effort, and conspicuity of a tripod in service of your artistic vision, even if our standards for each of these parameters have changed dramatically, you will clearly want to plan ahead of time the what, where, why, and how of that decision. As I say fairly regularly, pre-production is where it's at. So today I want to share with you tips, techniques, and a trick or two for working with tripods, specifically compact or travel tripods, sponsored by the good folks at Peak Design. But I want to pause here for a moment because when I say sponsored by and the good folks at Peak Design, this is not a random or pro forma thing, especially right now in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. First, like every other business from global conglomerates to solopreneurs like, say, YouTubers, keeping the wheels on the bus as COVID-19 wreaks havoc with the health and economic security of people around the globe, let alone people in our own backyards, literally as well as figuratively, is an incredible challenge. And it's a responsibility. So I want to tell you, I really appreciate how Peak Design sees both of them. Its concern for its employees and contractors have been clearly apparent in their communications with me, and I assume others, over the last couple of weeks. So has their recognition of the long view and the bigger picture. Which is why, second, over the next few days, April 7th through April 10th, Peak Design will donate 100% of the profits from each and every single sale of their travel tripod to COVID-19 relief and global climate change initiatives. This is a big deal to me personally. So kudos guys, and thank you. Third, it turns out that their travel tripod is one heck of a tripod, the most thoughtfully designed travel tripod I've ever seen, the most thoroughly engineered tripod of any class I have personally ever used. With all of that said, let's get back to tips and tricks for using any compact tripod, really irrespective of make or model. Now, I'm going to break this into four sections. I'm not going to bother telling you I'm going to do this quickly. First, the various use cases for why tripods should be one of your very first non-camera or lens purchases even today in 2020. Second, basic tips on aimed at those of you who are either new to or exasperated by your experience to date with tripods. Third, a few techniques to expand your repertoire of dynamic camera movement without investing in additional equipment. And lastly, how to eliminate the need for a monitor or even a rear screen altogether in an effort to minimize the size, weight, and cost of carrying your gear while still giving you real-time access and control to what your camera is seeing. Now, the great news is that as cameras have grown inexorably smaller and lighter, so have the tripods to support them. And the best of those tripods have been designed to accomplish this while maintaining rigidity, payload speed, and ease of use. Which in turn leads me to the one epiphany I want to share with you as the basis for everything that follows you should be looking for or working with the smallest possible camera lens combination consistent with your objectives and budgetary constraints because doing so will shrink the size, weight, and cost of every single accessory you then add to it and make you less conspicuous too. For me personally, having a tripod fit for purpose 
yet small enough that no one knows that I have one as I travel, light enough that I can forget I'm carrying it on my back, typically, and really fast to set up and take down our holy grail kind of territory. Especially when I'm on the street for urban landscape work or schlepping to locations for interviews or the one time I froze my ass off trying my hand at astrophotography in the Sonoran Desert. Okay, maybe that was TMI. But this is a big reason why three years on our go-to video cameras are still the Micro Four Thirds Panasonic GH5 as our A cam and Sony A6400 now as our B cam. Okay, on to use cases for tripods. Again, compact tripods in 2020. First up, long exposure photography beyond what image stabilization on the one hand or just placing a camera on a surface can address on the other. I'm talking about things like the aforementioned and accursed astrophotography, though, of course, your mileage may vary, and that's fine. I have friends who are terrific at it. Landscape photography, especially where smoothing waters, for example, is an aesthetic goal. Urban photography, where the goal is an exposure long enough to blur people and cars out of existence, though social distancing seems to be doing that for us right now, and, say, creative effects like street headlights or taillights from moving vehicles while the rest of the city is still. Second, what I'll call precise registration photography. Things like stitching for panoramas, exposure blending for high dynamic range landscapes, focus stacking for macro photography, and pixel shifting, terrific for product shots and archival documentation from cameras smaller and much less expensive than you'd think necessary. Third, action photography, where it's not only about shutter speed, but following the action. I'm talking, of course, about sports and wildlife, especially birding. That is hard to do. Fourth, smooth video camera movement, including the usual suspects, pants, tilts, slides, and jib or crane shots. Fifth, precise registration video, most especially for time lapses, whether they are in fact stills or sped up video clips. Sixth, locked down video shots. Things like interviews, we do those. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to know, Laz, what the heck were you thinking when you <laughs> shot Sublime Manhattan? Well, first of all, it is freaking awesome to be interviewed by you, Hugh. I've been watching you for a few years, and it's pretty good to find myself sitting here on YouTube. Somebody will be watching me. Talking head YouTube videos, we clearly do those. Cinematic shots in narrative or documentary films. We occasionally do those. And creative effects where slow shutter speeds well below the reciprocal of the frame rate can create, well, streaking lights of moving vehicles or, say, blurred people moving through a place like Grand Central Terminal in New York. I really, I can't get my mind off of New York City these days. I'm sure I've not exhausted the list of use cases, so please share your own suggestions in the comments section down below, because you guys are fantastic. Against this backdrop of purpose, let's shift to a surprisingly large number of, once I thought about it and winced at my own past errors, basic tips on using a tripod. Tip number one, because the first decision point for me is whether or not I can do what I want with a tripod without it getting in my way. No matter how small, well-built, or nice-looking the tripod case may be, ditch it all together and try to fit your tripod inside your backpack, preferably a backpack innocuous-looking enough that it doesn't scream photographer or videographer. It's not just about being inconspicuous. It's also about futzing with straps and clips, and especially about being considerate of other people when, say, you get into an elevator. 
I'm embarrassed to tell you how often I turned to speak to Claudia and managed to hit someone with a tripod attached to the exterior of my pack and then pretend it wasn't my fault. But by the way, if you really need all of your backpack's interior space, then allow me to change my mind. Do use the tripod bag if it is as compact and well-considered as the Peak Design unit. You can place it in a side pocket, like on my 20-liter Peak Design backpack, which I bought with my own hard cash, lash it down, and then access the tripod without having to futz with the straps. And it's still inconspicuous. Color me impressed. Although, if you're only carrying your camera with lens and a tripod, you probably want to use that case because the padding will matter to you as you hike along, say, Knife Edge in Acadia National Park and constantly have the darn thing otherwise swinging into your back, ribs, or kidneys. That's another story for another time. Tip number two. Deploy the legs, if your tripod allows, by releasing a set of leg section locking clamps, screw down, or lever type for each leg at the same time. It makes things much faster to set up. I've been able to do this with tripods of both types as long as the individual sections don't freely rotate, and that's not true of all tripods, but using levers is a clear advantage in this case. Something that you can do with the travel tripod that I've never been able to do before, locking leg sections across all three legs in rapid succession. I've never seen a travel tripod this quick. It's never occurred to me, and I don't think I ever could do that before. Tip number three, no matter the size of your tripod, it is always more stable the less you extend the legs. So unless you really need the height, it's better to bend over or crouch a bit more than to extend the tripod to maximum height, especially if that means extending a center column to its full height. This has the side benefit of giving you a perspective a little different than what you normally experience. I really like that. I should add that the most recent digital cameras with articulating rear screens, tilty or flippy, mirrorless or DSLR, make this dramatically easier than just a few years ago. I'm thinking of my Canon 5D2, especially now that those screens are larger, brighter, higher resolution, and increasingly less obstructed by the viewfinder. Yay! Tip number four. Especially when you're outdoors where it's windy or your camera and lens make the whole setup top-heavy, Use that small hook on the bottom of your center column to add some counterweight. This changes the center of gravity and not only makes the whole thing a lot less likely to topple over, it should help with vibration damping. That hook really is there for a reason. Hooking your backpack to it is an easy way to take advantage of it, but sandbags are cheap and light to carry on location, too. You can buy four of them rated at 25 pounds each, for example, for less than $20 on Amazon. But then, one, you have to fill them with something. And two, actually, I think the key is not to limit your thinking to sand. It's messy. Well, if you're at the beach, fine. You've got all the sand you need to fill the bags, and you didn't have to bring it with you. You'll still have to get it off. If you're in the mountains and you happen to be in a rock-strewn field with rocks small enough to load up the bag, okay, great. But what I like are individual water bottles. You should always have water anyway in order to stay hydrated. But this way, they serve as double duty. And if you're by a pond, lake, or stream, the empties are easy enough to fill. With all of this said... When I'm at home here in the bat cave or the bat studio downstairs and need extra weight, though, that's actually always only for the mic boom. I fill a bag with European coins no longer in circulation since the rise of the euro. Tip, call it 4A then. You can also, or alternatively, spread the legs wider. Some tripods have multi-angle legs, which allow you to set the whole rig closer to the ground. Use them. In low mode, the Peak Design Travel Tripod, which has this feature, will get down to just under 6 inches, though you will have to remove part of the center column, which it allows, and many tripods don't. I guess that makes this tip 4B. If you're using long glass, make sure to use the tripod collar so that the load is evenly spread, making it less likely to tip over. Tip number 5, make sure to tighten your head fully, lest you give away the sudden shift in the center of gravity, sending the whole thing crashing to the ground. I know wherever I speak. Tip 5A, now that I've settled on a numbering protocol, 
make sure to completely tighten your legs when you extend them, lest they give way the sudden shift. You know what I'm talking about, and you know why. Fortunately, the cam levers on the travel tripod are easy to open and close securely, positively, and not a broken fingernail or pinched finger in sight. Tip number six, quick release plates aren't your friends. They take up virtually no space, yet make setup and takedown that much quicker and surer. But tip number seven, therefore, is make sure you always have those pesky little hex wrench or flat bladed screwdrivers handy so that you can attach and detach QR plates to and from your camera or tighten tripod legs. That's regular maintenance. I've actually worn holes in my pockets from carrying stuff like that on my keychain. Fortunately, the Peak Design Travel Tripod has you covered with a detachable clamp with a dual size hex wrench on one of the legs for just this purpose. Well done. Tip number eight, pick the right head for the job. Do not bring with you more of a head or QR system than you need for your intended purpose because they'll just add weight and bulk. If you intend to do panoramic stitching, for example, do use a proper pano gimbal head with nodal slide and QR. This is worthy of an entirely separate video, but the bottom line is that registration is critical, as is properly aligning the optical center of the lens to eliminate parallax. Sports like football or soccer, wildlife like birding, a different kind of gimbal head for that specific purpose makes a big difference. If your intent is primarily video work, use a fluid or at least a high quality fluid like head and they are available. A ball head of any type or caliber for these last couple of uses is just not the right tool. Again, it's fascinating to me to see that Peak Design thought of this and created a universal head adapter available for the travel tripod. Yeah. Tip nine, similarly, don't bring a more robust set of sticks than you need. Again, I speak from experience, but that's yet another story for another time as well. And one reason why I have so many tripods. Nifty feature of the Peak Design Travel Tripod. You can actually remove all of the leg sections, save for the top three, and convert it into a super small, super lightweight backpacking tripod. Again, I've never seen a tripod so thoroughly thought through. Tip 10, conversely, Recognize that sometimes you'll need two tripods. I'm thinking about interviews, but more specifically about sliders, which is why to this point, I've rarely used sliders on location. You have to figure out if A, you can shoot your slider movement on the ground or vertically against and or lashed to something, that is without the tripod altogether. B, if you can get away with a light stand or lighter tripod for your second support, or C, if you really really need the shot and are willing to carry that weight in bulk to get it. You know, interviews, of course, we have to. But we don't need heavy tripods for that. Tip number 11, speaking of video, though equally important for stills work, make sure to level the head, even better, level the head, if you can see it, with the camera already in place. Which means you need to be able to see the bubble level with the camera in place. You can do this with the Peak Design tripod, but it's not always possible with other tripods and the latest cameras, of course, now have electronic levels themselves. Tip 11A, speaking of visibility, if you're shooting at night or where the light is low, even if you don't have a flashlight, you still have your smartphone to illuminate the way and use it. I can't tell you how often I rely on my phone for just this purpose. Now, I'd much rather have an illuminated bubble level. Then again, I'd much prefer that my cameras have illuminated buttons too. The Panasonic S1 series is the only mirrorless camera I can think of at the moment which has this. Though, as I recall, the Nikon D50 and at least one of the higher-end Canon Cinema EOS dedicated cameras have this as well. Again, if any of you can think of other cameras that have this, please let us know in the comments section below. And yes, you're right, then that means more battery drain or a separate battery, typically a button battery, and that's a lot of futzing. Tip number 12, use the camera's self-timer when doing locked down, especially precise registration shooting. Two seconds is usually enough for most scenarios, but for pixel shifting in particular, I've settled on a full 10 seconds. This is because we're talking about four or eight exposures in rapid succession where the image shifts as little as half a pixel from one frame to the next. I've found myself in the situation where the vibration of a subway line has been enough to ruin the pixel shifting shot. While we're at it, you may find a similar 
though different issue when trying to do pixel shifting urban landscapes from an especially high floor. The higher you go up in the newer skyscrapers, the more likely they are to be designed to literally sway in the breeze, which makes me ill. And of course would ruin your pixel shifting shot. Turning a little closer to earth and I wish my arm would stop clicking. It annoys me. Tip 13. If you intend to do macro photography or copy work, make sure there is clearance between the legs, make sure it's sufficient and that you can reverse the column to place the camera inside the legs or make sure your tripod can extend horizontally as well. Although I don't like this last one because the balance is almost always off. Tip 14, use as light a camera and lens combo as possible for the intended purpose, as I alluded to at the outset. And 14a, don't come close to the maximum payload capacity of your tripod or head, which are actually two separate things. Maybe you'll only be using a camera body and a single lens, but maybe there will also be times when you're using a base plate, rods, monitor, audio, and teleprompter, for example, or have a heavy duty pano gimbal, which will shift the center of gravity and put more pressure on the head. On the other hand, 15, while a fast wide angle lens on a full frame camera makes sense for astrophotography, for example, you just might be amazed what a smartphone can do for time lapses or what I lovingly refer to as the Gordon Lang walking, talking shot. I love you, Gordon. You know that. This in turn means tip 16. You may want to carry a smartphone holder with you because you will definitely have your cell phone with you. There are a number of them out there, a couple of really good ones, some of which are designed from the get-go to be Arca Swiss compatible, which I really, really appreciate. That's another cool thing about the Peak Design Travel Tripod. It actually comes with a smartphone mount tucked inside the center column. Very, very clever. Takes up less space than a dedicated smartphone mount, and you won't have to worry about forgetting to take one because it's always there. Tip 17. Don't lose the fiddly bits. I have a big, stonking, outstanding cinema tripod, interestingly enough, where the fluid head holds extra quarter 20 and 3 8 inch screws for the inevitable moment when you lose the one you have on set. Again, the good news about the Peak Design Travel Tripod is that some of the fiddly bits, like the removable counterweight hook and the smartphone mount that fits inside, are magnetized to do precisely that, help prevent the loss of fiddly bits, which is brilliant. Tip 18. Speaking of fiddly bits, if you're shooting landscape in severe terrain, you may want to make sure that your tripod has the option of spikes many tripods don't. Fortunately, once again, that option does exist for the Peak Design, though for me they're just more fiddly bits to keep track of or lose, though if you put them in the Peak Design travel tripod bag for which there is a specific place for them, problem solved. For most of us anyway, as the great Shakespearean philosopher Clint Eastwood once said, a man has to know his limitations. Over the last decade or so, during what I'll call the great democratization of high production value videography, sliders, for one, have replaced dollies, or to be more precise, given us the opportunity to simulate dolly shots with acceptable and sometimes brilliant results at a fraction of the cost or time. It is also the case that lightweight, three axis motorized gimbals have replaced steady cams, steady cam vests, and arms and the two-man or three-man crew often necessary to create similar, though clearly not exactly the same effect, again, at a fraction of the cost or time or setup. Ditto inexpensive consumer drones replacing to identical effect crane and jib shots. But every one of these can be replicated to one extent or another in a jam with just your camera, standard lens, and a tripod like these.
One last tip slash technique to keep your kits small, light, and highly performant when working with tripods. And that is to use your smartphone or tablet as both a monitor and remote. This is something I've been doing for years now while recording YouTube videos. Even though I have a couple of outstanding monitors that I use for interviews, I now generally prefer using my iPhone or iPad and the remote app software from manufacturers like Sony, Panasonic, Fujifilm, DJI, not only to see precisely what the camera is seeing, but to control that camera through tap, touch, and drag directly on those smart device screens. They are great as a director's monitor when, for example, Claudia is manning a tripod or a gimbal on location, and we can then co-create the final framing, happen to be in the frame, no high-end solution with its associated weight, cost, and complexity necessary. I'll take the inevitable trade-off in latency. Though, an extra battery or three will become important, as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi constantly on will run down any battery very quickly. Tripods are a daily part of my routine. Just like with camera bags, those of us who use one often search for the rest of our lives for the one. As I bid you adieu for now, and as I said at the beginning, remember that between April 7th and April 10th, 100% of Peak Design's profits on every travel tripod sale will go to COVID-19 relief and global climate change initiatives. This matters to me personally greatly. And I'm delighted to tell you, yeah, it's an awesome piece of kit.